So welcome everyone. Uh, good afternoon. It's a late in the day. Uh, we had a, well I had a fantastic day. I hope you did. Again, on behalf of WISH to welcome you all and also to gather at this very important uh, gathering to introduce the launch of the International Phenome Center Network here at Doha. There's an interesting story behind this and why Doha. In actual fact, it goes back to 2012, around the Olympics, when WISH, with a slightly different name, it was called the Global Health Policy Summit, which was in partnership with Qatar Foundation, was held in London in the Guild Hall uh, just around the summer of the Olympics. And at that meeting, one of our speakers was the UK's Prime Minister, uh, the Honourable David Cameron, and where he announced on that day the launch of the UK National Phenome Centre. Quite a big announcement, considering it was part of the Olympic legacy. And that was uh, driven and funded by two organizations, but driven by two leaders. The one on my left, and that was Dame Sally Davis through the National Institute of Health Research, in partnership with the Medical Research Council, and that was Sir John Savile in those days. And that was a very, very exciting announcement. And there was a leader for such a center, and that is my colleague and my partner in research. We work in the same institution and that's Professor Jeremy Nicholson. Jeremy led this in four years, and I think most of you will know the fruits of that work, but I could share you my own personal example, and that was in the area of co-producing, uh, and this is getting a chemist to come to the operating theater, which was the intelligent knife, very much doing uh, metabolic phenotyping of tumors, and trying to reduce one major hurdle in cancer surgery, which is positive margins. And thanks to Jeremy and his drive, that is becoming a tool or a product that will be utilized in clinical care. So welcome you to that. And I think today's uh, International Phenome Center Network has three functionalities. One is better understanding of the human population variations to inform global public health policies, and we heard a lot of the challenges facing us when it comes to public health policies, creating a framework for metrics to measure individuals' health status, and also to conduct fast and efficient and high-quality research generated from harmonized data and integrated study from across the world. The world is a small place, as we all know. We've seen that today. And I think this network, or the launch of this international network, will further facilitate that. So on that note, it gives me a great pleasure, and also we're absolutely privileged having Dame Sally Davis. You've heard her sp speech this morning. She's a superwoman. Despite her cold, she stood up there and gave the most wonderful, wonderful talk. So I'm going to hand over to Sally to say a few words. I probably, you've gathered seeing me, I have to chase some important people around the corridors. Uh, you probably saw me earlier, and I may have to leave in about five minutes or so. Sally. Thank you very much, Ara. Jeremy, thank you for the invitation. Yes, it was part of the legacy of the uh, Olympics, and I remember Russell Hamilton, who helped me set up the National Institute of Health Research in the UK, working very hard with both GSK and the MRC to make the funding happen and the transfer. We'd thought it would be a gift to us, but um, unfortunately, we had to pay. But I think it's been absolutely worth it uh, when we look at your output. And if you think about how we've been working from NIHR and what I've been doing most of my time, it's how do we get scientific collaboration and partnership across the UK, but then much broader internationally. We've got a whole big program of exchanges around health and life sciences, how we link the basic sciences to translational, to clinical, and even the regulation and um, medical devices. But it is this concept of a network, which I think is very exciting, building on what you have done 
making us the UK Centre of Excellence, this National Phenome Centre. And Jeremy, your leadership there has really developed that capacity to perform the large-scale metabolic phenotyping of the human population for stratified medicine. And you've worked very closely with our National Institute of Health Research Biomedical Research Centres, which we fund, and the NHS, to make sure that this translates further and faster. And we are facing this amazing confluence coming together of environment, lifestyles, and genomes. The rise in chronic diseases, as well as the risk of infectious diseases and AMR, which I focused on this morning. And all of these chronic diseases are going to pose, oh, they're starting to, but it will only get worse, a massive socioeconomic burden on the healthcare system. And they're going to be aggravated not only by um, social inequities and global warming, but all the biological consequences that run through from those. And they're going to be, as we know now from epigenomics, some of this will be intergenerational. And that gets to be not only fascinating, but terribly important if we're going to modify, and diagnose, modify, do things. Will it impact only on that individual? Will it impact on the family? How does it follow through into other generations? And if we're going to do this work, we have to get on with it. It's, it's like so much research. It's unethical not to do it. It's unethical to be slow about it. We need global solutions and we need multi-centre cooperation and research alignments. And so I think that the way you're going forwards is absolutely the way. I'm very excited about how you've developed phenomics to become... Is that the right word, phenomics? Oh, good. Key pillar of... I thought I might have suddenly made it up. A key pillar of evidence-based medicine, and I know how important it can be for drug development as well as diagnosis and treatment and how you're beginning to look at how it works to predict drug efficacy and safety. If we can start to improve diagnosis, treatment, and enhance patient outcomes using metabolic phenotyping and actual physiological status in real time, then we're beginning to make progress. So I think that this is fantastic. The international network and partnerships are crucial. Not always easy building international partnerships, but I know you've managed across the UK, so I, you are already demonstrating your consensual, empowering leadership. You're going to have to work on global harmonization of technologies, methods, and data output, but you are, as a result, going to improve our understanding of lifetime disease risk better validation and effectiveness of therapies, not only for groups but individuals. And I think you'll be able to give us a framework for making collective decisions around healthcare roadmaps and future diseases through this shared governance in a non-profit making environment. And what a lot of expertise you're going to need. And you've got experimental design, analytical chemistry, bioinformatics, stats, it's great that the UK can play its part, that you've shown you can draw on our strong research base, our great facilities and clinical practice, but by going global, this network will make a big difference. So it's a pleasure to see all our international colleagues here today, engaged already with this concept of an international phenome centre network, and... I understand it falls to me to formally say how delighted I am to officially launch the International Phenome Centre Network. Well much. done, and let me hand over to you, Jeremy. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Sorry, uh, well, thanks, uh, Sally, very much for that. It, it is... Um, and, and thanks to Ara for giving us the introduction. Uh, so it is, a, is, as Ara has mentioned, there is a sort of uh, symmetry here. Can we have the next slide up? Yes. Um, there is a sort of symmetry here because the, the original uh, Phenome Centre was launched at a, at a WISH conference or something very close to that. And now the international network is a natural place to try and launch it. The other thing is, of course, um, WISH is all about aspiration and mapping the future healthcare needs and trying to pick out emergent threats. The way I feel about it is we need something like the Phenome Centre Network 
to use your words, to give that teeth uh, and actually be able to do something about that at the basic le uh, level. And if it's not the Phenome Centre Network on its own, there will be other parts as well to emerge from this, but I think I'd like to think that this is a very good start for that. So what are we trying to do? We're trying to do, I suppose, precision medicine in its broader sense. And precision medicine isn't just about patients, it's also about people. And precision medicine is about understanding the basic variation in biology of people which helps us understand disease risk and also helps us treat them best when we know what's wrong with them. And so the result uh, of that is to be, have to be able to study very deep human biology with using a whole range of metrics, genetic, proteins and metabolites, which is one of the things that we're uh, particularly good at. The reason that we are the people we are is because of our gene environment interactions and that's a through life activity. Uh, so in the effects of environmental exposure in early life have different effects to later on in life. And we have to understand the longitudinal nature of that shifting biology to understand our true health state and be able to intervene with that. But also, as this slide sort of shows, it actually has other things to it as well. Just being able to measure stuff is not good enough. You have to understand how to implement it, which is the translational step, which is basically persuading doctors to do what you think is good from the science point of view. And that's actually quite a difficult uh, task in its own right. But once we have this sort of precision knowledge, we will be able to change the way we have care, that we manage care pathways in, in, in obviously beneficial ways and ideally in ways that save money as well as save patients' uh, lives. But there's a lot of translational barriers and technology only gets us to a certain level. Um, in the next slide, I just want to just show you gene environment interactions. You know, Francis Crick, G the genome is the, or the genes are the, the, the blueprint of life. Blueprint doesn't tell you anything about how a machine works. So if you have a blueprint of a nuclear power station, it doesn't tell you anything about atoms. So a blueprint, or, or, or nuclear physics for that matter, a, a blueprint tells you about how to build something. And that's what a genome does. So a genome is a set of instructions for building an organism. And how that's built is determined by what you eat and how you exercise and all the other things in your life. And the other thing that we... Um, have to remember is that we've also got another set of genes inside us which are very important called the microbial genome uh, or, the, or the microbiome. There's something like 10 million genes that you have in the gut right as opposed to our 20,500 uh, protein coding genes um, and there is about a kilogram in the, each of us and uh, during our lifetimes we can put about 15 to 20 tonnes of bacteria down the toilet which is quite an amazing piece of physiology when you think about it. But all of those microbes are doing stuff, they are operating combined with our genes. We have reduced genomes because we devolve some of the responsibility for our biology to those organisms. And we cannot possibly think of precision medicine or precision patients without taking into account that extra microbiological step. So through the gene environment interactions, the microbiome is the interface. Everything pretty much goes through microbes before it gets to us. And out of the emergent property that comes out of the gene environment interactions is the phenome. So philosophically, it's where genes and environment meet analytically it's all the things you can measure about your body that allow you to say who you are. Um, and we can think about technologies associated with that. And that's what the Phenome Centre runs on. It runs on advanced chemical technologies for measuring a lot of things, a lot of metabolites, small molecules in the body. And the reason that metabolites are important is because your phenome an important part of it is metabolism. So the same gene environment interactions that determine your likelihood of getting disease also determine your metabolic phenotype. So if we can measure that in great detail, we can start answering those fundamental biological pro problems. There are two ways of deploying technology. One is to look for disease risk. So this is a bit like a, a genome-wide association where we're looking at gene variation in relation to disease risk. Well, we have a metabolome-wide association as well. So we look at metabolic signatures and try and understand those in relation to cancer risk or cardiovascular risk. But you can also use the same technology in a clinical phenome centre. And we have an NIHR, BRC-funded clinical phenome centre at Imperial as well, where we've aligned the technology with the patient journey to get better diagnostics and prognostics. So same technologies in some ways similar mathematics, but entirely different uh, biological outcomes. And so I'm going, I'll leave it with that one. So the network, what's it going to do? Okay, it's going to basically do what we do, right? So we've built a whole series of very um, precise technologies uh, for doing extremely high quality analytical chemistry. 
under rugged and robust conditions, so it doesn't fall over very easily. And we've created a huge database, and we're taking through many, many studies, not only clinical and stratified medicine and epidemiological, and we're building an enormous amount of information. Now, wouldn't it be great to be able to consider, consider and look at the comparative biology of disease across the world without having all of the analytical variation that throws up this mist or fog? And so that's really the, one of the fundamental drivers of the international network, which is to create technology that's harmonized, very high quality and shareable across the world, um, and be able to together take on these great challenges identified by WISH and other major conferences. So antimicrobial resistance, autism, these are things that have come up today and come up repeatedly, uh, cardiovascular diseases, cancers. And so between institutions, we can build new technology platforms and capabilities that can attack these things in a way that probably has not been possible before. The other thing I just want to mention is we also have at Imperial, but Ara mentioned it very briefly, some real-time technology as well, which uses similar instrumentation in some ways, but ca is capable of delivering information on a second time scale. So, for instance, the Intelligent Knife Project, which John Rudan will talk about in a, in a moment, it's, uh, basically it's taking the smoke from diathermy, which is a waste product of surgery, and pumping it into a mass spectrometer and analysing three times a second what the surgeon is cutting through cancer or not cancer, and feeding it back to them. So in addition to the phenome centers, there's also this completely new type of re real-time technology which is going to become available very, very quickly. Uh, I remember telling Sally a few couple of years ago, in fact, it also works with food stuffs as well. So we had a, a, a food um, uh, scandal a couple of years ago. We got donkey meat into the, uh, basically the beef supply. Well, this can detect 1% horse meat in a sausage instantaneously uh, and uh, is going to potentially be able to uh, improve the food chain, chain as well. Also, we want to make pathologists redundant, if at all possible, because they're very expensive and slow. Actually, they're wonderful people and we need them, but we have new technologies right, for scanning mass spectrometry, which allowed us to lead histo read histopathological slides and use computers to automatically diagnose uh, the, the pathology. Um, so, this is a very slow clicker. Um, so that's the patient journey, just to give you an idea. There are different boxes, different colours, if you like, of the boxes, and different operations and procedures go on. So on the left-hand box, then there's diagnosis, ultrasound, and now phenomics with mass spec and NMR in there diagnostically. Then there's an intervention. We can mo monitor the intervention in real time uh, using our technologies. And then there's an outcome, which we can also model mathematically to try and see if there are pre-interventional signatures that predict uh, biological or, or healthcare outcomes. So the whole of this technology platform folds back in multiple different ways to help um, uh, address problems, not only at the public health level, but also uh, in personalised healthcare. And there's lots of different ways of slicing the data too. So we're thinking about using this for training in the future as well, for training of clinicians, for undergraduates, for involving patients with their data as well. So this is, it also is deeply, has a deep healthcare outreach in a, in a non-technological direction too. Finally, this is a global health conference and we have interests in the developing world as well as the developed. So the developing world can never afford the sorts of exploratory technology that we have, right? But when we are generating new markers and models of disease, we, we generate information that can be deployed in simpler and cheaper ways. So, for instance, we've already shown this is Professor Elaine Holmes from Imperial has done some fantastic work with MRC in the Gambia and shown that very complex uh, pieces of analytical chemistry and modelling done at Imperial and liver diseases can be reapplied uh, in much cheap, cheapened and simplified form uh, to liver diseases in, in tropical countries. So um, I'm, I've finished talking now. Um, I hope you're all going to enjoy uh, the next couple of talks about the further adventure moving greater into tr clinical translation. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jeff Ginsberg, and I'm from Duke University, where I um, direct the Center for Applied Genomics and Precision Medicine. I really appreciate being here as part of this event, and uh, congratulations on uh, initiating the inter uh, International uh, Phenome Center Network. Um, what I've been asked to do is contextualize uh, uh, this network in, in, the, in the sense of precision medicine. This morning, 
if you were at the precision medicine uh, session today, um, you heard a very robust discussion about uh, the, the field and where it's going um, on this slide, which was part of our report. Um, we made the point that precision medicine is actually happening today um, across the lifespan. On the left-hand side, um, couples are using uh, genomics uh, for reproductive, reproductive counseling, and uh, all the way to the right-hand side of this slide, uh, uh, there are some centers that are doing molecular autopsies and uh, a number of opportunities in between, most of which have been driven by uh, DNA-based technologies. Um, but I think the point here is that uh, the genomics in combination with metabolomics uh, can be extremely powerful. Already in newborn screening, metabolomics is uh, used extensively um, uh, to identify inborn errors in metabolism. Uh, in undiagnosed and rare diseases, metabolomics combined with genomics is being used to help identify the causal genomic variants. Um, in sepsis, as we've uh, heard earlier, um, the opportunity uh, for metabolomics to help provide predictive signatures uh, is already in existence, and in pr particularly also in pharmacogenomics, where the genetic variation in drug response, drug metabolizing enzymes, along with metabolic profiling, can really be quite powerful uh, to predict drug uh, response or resistance. Uh, the second point um, I wanted to make was uh, we've heard a lot uh, today about data generation, about uh, data integration about data analytics and about data interpretation. And of course, at the initiation of the uh, Phenome Center network, uh, the focus will be on metabolomics and clinical uh, phenotypes assessed by its investigator community. But as I've discussed with Jeremy, I think a vision for the future is the integration of this data with um, all kinds of uh, relevant information for healthcare, not just genomes and metabolomes, but also electronic medical record data sensor data, which is physiologic monitoring on a continuous basis, as well as uh, uh, the environmental and geospatial data that would, when put together, will enable uh, a very different uh, type of discovery platform, driving data analysts from across the globe to really define novel biology of disease, to build predictive algorithms, and to help really stratify medicine. So this is on a probably a 10-year horizon, but it's certainly something I think we would all hope and aspire uh, to have as our vision. The third point I wanted to make, if I can advance the slides, really has to do with this notion of translation that Jeremy already mentioned. We really want to achieve impact of, of all of these technologies on, on, on the human condition and on healthcare, which means that first and foremost, as we heard in our precision medicine session this morning, that we really need to engage patient communities uh, to be partners um, in research and I think, at least early on, focusing on rare diseases as well as common chronic diseases would be quite important. And having longitudinal follow-up so we can, not, we, we can measure sam uh, the metabolomics of samples today, but also use that to predict future events, so creating the models that will enable um, a predictive um, uh, response or resistance or progression of disease. And as the Phenome Center is definitely committed to standardization and harmonization of the metabolomic um, platforms. Uh, I think a similar uh, type of uh, standardization has to occur with t in terms of clinical phenotyping to optimize the use of this information, um, as well as coordination with other types of, uh, of platforms that are emanating from genome-based technologies. Um, one of the other fundamental aspects is, uh, of the center will be its data sharing uh, platform. So certainly. Um, this will be a pioneer and a leader uh, in the area of, of, of defining the, uh, the policy and the governance agendas that will enable this community to actually optimize the data that it's uh, generating. And then finally, uh, partnerships. Partnerships bo with both healthcare delivery systems that will eventually need to implement and, and get those doctors to do, do things that they may not often want to do but also partnerships with, the, with industry and it's really, um, it's really great to have the waters and as an industry partner from the get-go because uh, these, these technologies will only get out of the laboratory if there was a, um, a, um, a commercial vehicle for, it, for them to do so. I think my last point is, is really on, you know, what we really all have been aspiring to do since 2003 when the genome was first uh, sequenced was to really figure out how to impact um, healthcare delivery and the health of, health of patients. And I would argue that the Phenome Center is going to be part of a multidisciplinary ecosystem, uh, which obviously is focused on genomics and metabolomic technologies, 
but also that ecosystem that's enabling precision health will include electronic me medical records and mobile health technologies, will obviously include the engagement of patients as partners in research. Um, the whole goal, uh, one of the goals of the Phenome Center should be to advance diagnostics into multi-analyte signatures that could be used in doctor's offices routinely. Um, the data science component, this community is absolutely integral, um, as well as the implementation science community that actually figures out how to get these technologies into complex healthcare delivery systems. And finally, as this meeting highlights enormously, is that policy agenda that needs to pave the way for all of this uh, to, to happen and so that we can all be part of this uh, wonderful vision for precision medicine and health. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, my name is John Rudan, and uh, it's my pleasure to be here on behalf of Queen's University at Kingston, Ontario in Canada, on behalf of my colleagues to, uh, to, to, to come in and offer our support and our integral uh, uh, and, and, and be an, an integral part of the in, uh, International Phenome Center Network. Um, our, my original uh, contact with Jeremy was th three years ago. And one of the things that struck us at that point was what he was saying made eminent sense. And it didn't take very much uh, talking and, 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 and cajoling in our, in our university to get, to get everybody on board because it makes eminent sense. And it followed basically a lot of the principles that we follow in, in our health science research and our clinical care. One of the greatest challenges that we have and that, that face governments and face healthcare administration is that we have to create systems that will in the future provide better care for more people at cheaper cost. That's a tremendous, that's a tremendous challenge. We all know that in all diseases, and cancer being one of them, that in cancer we'll see that the global health burden for cancer is almost going to double the number of cancers around the world that, gonna, uh, that are going to be needed to treat it over the next 20 years. And we see that as people get older, typically we don't get better clinically, we have more comorbidities. And these comorbidities will make the challenge of managing cancers and managing clinical diseases much more difficult. And, not, and when they're more difficult, they're more difficult for us to treat, more expensive to treat, and more difficult for the patients themselves. So we have high social costs and we have high personal costs for these. And in doing so, we have to do this with the patient remaining in the center of our, of our focus. As physicians, we have to always remember that. And as providers in healthcare, we have to keep them at the center. But the other thing about this is that the episodes of care throughout the life are not just the one time that we meet the patient in the clinic. We have to follow the patient throughout their life. And then during the course of their lifetime, they're gonna meet pa the, the patient's gonna meet almost every specialist that, uh, that, is out, that, that, that is in our system. And each one of us in our specialty is going to touch the patient in a certain way. And all the aspects of what we do aren't going to be confined just to surgery or confined to the microbiology lab. It's going to be all aspects of the clinical medicine. So precision medicine will apply to all aspects of me medicine going forward. The idea of this is not just to provide the right patient care at the right time, but there's also a cost to uh, not only getting it right, but also remembering there's a cost of getting it wrong. We need to identify what causes patients harm. We need to know when the therapies work and who they're going to work on and how well they're gonna work. But at the same time, we don't wanna have patients suffer needlessly for the things that don't work. Those things cost. They cost the healthcare system and they cost the patients. And the better we can define things, the better the life, the life of our patients are gonna be. So we need to look at how to do this well, not only for the patients that are going to work, but also for the patients that aren't gonna work. It helps us to make the appropriate decisions. And so we are confronted as we get better at doing more things with bigger computers and bigger ability to analyze data. We move from the era of physician in intuition to physicians looking at uh, care based on algorithms and looking at uh, large clinical studies. But now we're in moving into the age of precision. And that age of precision is going to allow us to do things that we couldn't do before, to provide not only precise, but accurate treatment. Accurate for the patients that, that do need treatment and also accurate for the patients that don't need specific, uh, certain types of, of treatments. 
This is particularly important for me as a surgeon because although what we're going to be talking about today is in the clinic, we have to provide for that patient precision, not only precision in getting the right diagnosis, but also precisely removing the tumor. And I use the example of breast cancer. In Canada, it's the largest uh, cancer that's that, that uh, new cancer uh, presentation in our clinics with 30,000 uh, Canadian women getting breast cancer every year. And we want to provide for those patients, we want to provide them the greatest maximum uh, ch chance of survival, maintaining cosmesis, and maintaining function. This is typical for all the things we do. Well, how well are we doing when we do lumpectomies for small tumors? When we take a look in clinical practice, we can see that 15 to almost 40, almost 50 percent of patients that have lumpectomies for breast cancer, and this is in modern first world countries will have a positive margin. That positive margin carries with it a tremendous cost. It costs to the patient that has to have undergo several surgeries to finally get a sterile, uh, to get the, the negative margin. Also with the loss of uh, breast tissue and, 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 and social well-being, it costs patients and it costs our countries to rehabilitate the breast and to provide better functional ability for the patient. So what do we do? One of the things that, we did, that Jeremy talked about before was the eye knife. The eye knife is basically an, an, an incredible, powerful technique that brings basically metabolomic fingerprinting of signatures into the operating room where we basically take the smoke that's coming out from the surgical knife as we cut through our tissues and analyzes that in real time to tell us that we're in tumor. But one of the things that we want to also do, is wh which attracted me as a person who likes to do uh, clinical navigation, is to marry it with, with technologies that we have at Queen's to try to get the patient's directed, or try to get the surgeon's knife directed closer to the tumor without entering the tumor and bringing further planning into it. And in doing so, when we marry these two technologies together, we have a chance and opportunity to decrease the number of positive margins, hopefully close to zero. Even if we reduce that burden by 50 percent to go from, uh, on average, 25 percent positive margins to 12 percent positive margin, the benefits are real. In Canada alone, it'll save $46 million in direct patient, er, direct hospital costs to our system. Around the world, that would translate to about a billion and a half dollars just by reducing that one episode of care and improving the health care of our patients. So we see around the world. We see the opportunities to bring people together to look for solutions that will provide us with, with care in the future. Just like we want to bring our healthcare systems together, we also want to bring our researchers together. We, together we're stronger in doing our things together and working together and harmonizing. That's how we do our medicine, that's how we do it best. And so we look forward to doing this at Queen's. At Queen's we're fortunate enough to have the cl Cancer Clinical Trials Group for, for uh, Canada at our, hosted at our center. And we plan on using those resources together to bring the 40 countries that we, we do our clinical trials around the world together and help to bring, uh, at, and bring phenomics to our assessment tools and helping to make the world a better place for all patients and all people. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have just about uh, 10 minutes or so to answer any questions that you might have. Uh, Sally, do you want to come up and join us? Are you, you happy to? Thank you. Um, so, um, what haven't we told you that you need to know? What? How do you get involved? Okay, write me an email is the easiest way. Um, it's actually, this is an interesting uh, evolution that's occurred. It's occurred through groups that we've been working on and off in, uh, together, sort of not as a whole unit, uh, but we haven't gone on to any sort of marketing campaign to do this. So it's basically a, a sort of a, a sort of a, a random um, uh, um, arrangement of people who worked well together in the past which have now consolidated. So I think after we've now announced this officially, I mean the, the, the door is open and we would be welcome anybody to inquire. We have a web website for the network has gone live this afternoon um, and what is it, phenomecenter.com org is it or something like that yes it's pretty boring but anyway so you can now find out all about it and um, we're, we're any of us in who's in your locale we're very happy to come around and talk to you about what we're doing within it I think the the important thing to stress is that we started the Phenome Centre, of course, right, partly because of Dame Sally's vision and be able to see into the future for that but we don't want to dominate it in the future. What we want to do is create a distributed network because this is too big for one university or, or even one country. So we want lots of people to be involved and we want to create a new governance structure that allows us 
to be able to uh, integrate our ideas and go forward as a group. Someone else. Yep. Yes, please. who's also a tobacco control researcher at Stanford. And I was wondering, is there any preliminary data about the utility in determining who will develop lung cancer, which smokers, you know, to try to utilize these tests to predict their likelihood, as well as the efficacy of the existing tobacco control treatments? Do you envision this as part of the future? Right. There could be a short answer or a really complicated long answer. I'll try and give you the short answer. There isn't anything definitive at the moment, and that's because that... Uh, although there are certainly signatures of smoking, you can detect someone who's a smoker metabolically even years after they've, they've done it, right? So that's quite interesting. There's a, there's a sort of echo from it, which tells you that something is, you know, physiologically has been changed. But of course, it's very, very complicated because what you have to have is the right sort of cohorts. They have to, you have to have all the appropriate metadata so you can dissect out the other lifestyle variables. And within our Phenome Centre, we haven't done a, a, a full-scale trial with anything that's related to lung cancer yet, but there's indications that that will be possible in the future. Mm. Yes, Lord Pryor. Can I risk asking a question which may be very stupid? Um, if, you, if you are able to combine genomics and phenomics, as Sally described it, um, together, um, how accurate, I mean, how, what, what sort of quantum jump in accuracy of diagnosis and in treatment are you, like, are you likely to get to? Does it, does, it, do, does it radically change medicine as we know it? I think the answer is yes. I'm going to say something, and can I turn it over to you as well? Right, so, so the, uh, I think I mentioned to you earlier, one of the things about patient stratification by genomics is you can subdivide people into different genetic subclasses of breast cancer or whatever it is. But within any treatment regime, there is a variation in the response still, right? So that's due to your physiological and biological, probably microbiological variation, right? So having a genomic classifier to start with and then a phenomic modifier should be able to make you much more precise in terms of being able to handle that patient. You want to say something about that? Well, I agree. Okay. Yeah, I would uh, <laughs> echo that. I guess, um, you know, we have to remember that the genome is, is static, the DNA analysis is static, but the um, metabolome and the phenomics are dynamic and can really report out on uh, a number of environmental perturbations or other, uh, other influences on, on, the, on, the life, uh, on the lifespan of an individual. So you would at least infer that having both would be more powerful than, than just one because it gives you that a rich amount of uh, information about those uh, environmental influences on health and disease. I would say that the, um, from a data analytics perspective, you're also asking a question about diagnostic accuracy. Does having uh, one platform added to a second really make a significant incremental change that will really modify the behavior of, of a physician in making a decision? And I think that part remains to be seen. But I think the, the, the data sets that are already being generated are allowing the analytical community to begin to develop those uh, those models and we have to see whether the ROC curves are significantly different when you add the other components. I think actually let me tag something else on which we haven't mentioned so far which I think it's important. Um, there's this whole issue which is now known as the exposome which is a fashionable new word for basically all the things that get in your body and can perturb you so in pollutants etc. All the technology we've developed in the Phenome Centre is designed so that it has very broad scanning range, right? So it goes outside normal human physiology, it goes into the microbiome, but it also goes into the exposome. There's a very interesting uh, uh, situation, the triclosan was banned by the FDA last you know, September because um, it's something that goes in toothpaste and soap. And there's, there's been suggestion that it's very toxic for a long time. Certainly in animals, it's an endocrine disruptor uh, and it's a carcinogen. Um, and so I just asked one of our people, I said, can we find triclosan in any of the samples that are run through the Phenome Center? And up to 30% of the study populations have triclosan. This is normal people wandering around the streets of London, right? Uh, have got things in them that we have no idea what they're actually doing. And if I was to measure everybody in this room with our, our Phenome Center methods, right, we would find probably 35% of you think would have some sort of drug or exposure agent that were detectable to our methods. So what's fascinating is you get studies in to do about, you know, 
heart disease or cardiovascular disease, but they've all got metadata, and you can go into those data sets and remind them for totally different things using this standardized methodology. those sorts of things, and how extensive is that data set that you collect? Okay, um, it, it, I think you can answer that as well, but the, it varies from study to study, right? So for the National Phenome Centre, we specify there must be a minimum set of metadata. It involves, you know, age, sex, and all the usual ethnicity, all the stuff that epidemiologists normally tick, but also another omics data set. So almost every study has got genomics in it or GWAS in it. Some have got epigenetic information as well. We wanted to make this a systems approach. But when you're talking about clinical specification, this is what you're talking about now, sort of clinical phenomics. Yeah, yeah. It, it, that sort of information, all of that information, of course, as you know, not everybody collects all the information. So I think one of the jobs of the network will be to specify what the minimum information that is required, right, to make this, you know, this, this maximally useful. Yeah. So rem remember... Remember? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Remember that the Framingham Heart Study collected a fairly minimal demographic I'm data set along with some biological data to develop a very powerful risk prediction tool, but as uh, I, I've encouraged uh, the network to consider um, the use of not, not just electronic medical records, which are reasonably data dense, although they're sporadic, but also to uh, encourage um, the use of person or patient reported data. So it's not just uh, uh, relying on a, a, an abstract objective measure, which is in the EMR, but really can give you some rich personal derived information. So the power will come from the combination of these these types of data along with the um, genomic and metabolomic data. One of the things I was uh, what, what intrigued us particularly in, in, in our cancer research is that in Canada we have a unique number for all of our patients. So in everybody in Canada has a unique number that can be followed through the, the the hospital records in each in each encounter that occurs in the hospital. And now that's been expanded to the to the. Uh, primary health care group as well. So now what we're able to do is our, our, our data that we're going to be gathering in our cancer phenome center network, which is part of actually the, the, there has been a genomic part and a proteomic part of that, and this is going to be the other layer with the metabolomic part added to it. But that also will be automatically, if you will, added to our, our, our longitudinal database, which is part of our, our CHI-HI database. So that gives us not only the ability to look at that moment in time and that episode of, uh, of, their, of, their, of their care during their disease, but we by automatically and, de um, um, and by default, we'll be able to follow that patient and that journey through that patient's uh, lifetime through, through, uh, through, through this for all of our patients in Canada. Um, Dame Sally spoke earlier on about the the sort of ethical requirement for us to sort of get on and get this data and address these big problems quickly. So um, could you comment on how the, the network working together rather than as individual groups is going to be able to um, push the whole process of um, medical discovery faster? Who are you asking? Anyone who will answer. Yeah, you started it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how they're going to work together, but a network, if it develops a governance, will find ways, and I have great faith in these three as, as some of the founders. But I, I hold to that, that it's unethical not to do research that we need to improve patient outcomes. So I'm sure now we've given them this challenge, they'll find a way of doing it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the other thing is, of course, it, every different country's got slightly different ways of doing this, and we have to be able to work together in that way. But that's part of the joy of the challenge of this, isn't it? I guess I view the, the, the term network as some um, opposite of silos and, you know, being able to de-silo the data and the investigators from each other in a network community that actually collaborates, shares data, and shows that they can replicate each other's findings would in my mind, certainly accelerate the science. Uh, Jeremy, um, often people think about uh, precision medicine at the individual level. And I just wondered whether the panel had any thoughts about how these data that you might collect uh, and the way that you do it 
uh, using plants and doing environmental studies as well might actually contribute to precision public health. So how, how, let me try and get that right. So you're talking about uh, sort of plant studies and other environmental yeah. studies. I am, yeah. Well, th th I mean, they contribute in an in indirect way in that they are often involved in the uh, development of the analytical methodology. They're often development of the identification of compounds which flux through our bodies as part of the sort of a lifestyle environment, nutritional uh, uh, sort of exposome, uh, if you like, and, and potentially mathematically, methodologically, they can contribute. Um, I'm not absolutely sure exactly what you can learn from about human physiology from plants directly. Uh, any of the other panel would like to uh, to make a comment on that? I, I wasn't going to say much about the plants, but <laughs> I I, uh, I think that uh, one way to think about precision public health is that it's the sum of the individual data sets that that can be acquired through either the center's type of activity or or other types of of data. So if we had, um, you know, if, if we had knowledge of geographic locations that has signals in it that were signals of toxicity or signals of, of, of maybe, um, uh, in, you know, poor, poor lifestyle or behavioral habits, that might be a way for public health officials to deliver more targeted approaches to those communities. So if we could think about this as a broad map of, uh, you know, where are uh, their health um, promoting signatures or data that is coming out of the phenome center and health uh, maybe risk more risk uh, associated um, um, uh, data sets that would help I think to guide policy decisions on where to focus public health opportunities. Right the sign says says time is up two seconds to the appropriate time so on that I think we'll, we'll bring this to a close thank you very much for being here uh, thank you for our partners and being so collaborative. Um, we look forward to, a, I think, a real adventure in the future and something, hopefully, that will be good for everybody in the world. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.